Maddie Pendleton. Actually, truth to tell, my name is Harriet Maria um, Erskine Gilmore Pendleton. And part of the reason for my having all those names is really an explanation about what seaport towns in the 1870s were like. You see, I was, um, um, I can start at the beginning. Um, I was born in, in Prospect, which became Stockton, and which you know as Stockton Springs, um, in 1847. And my sister Ella was born two years later. Um, our family moved west to Searsport, and that's where we grew up. Um, both of us married um, Searsport sea captains, master mariners they were called. Ella married first, and she married um, Frank Irving Pendleton. And then four months later, um, I married oh, Jonathan Locke Clifford Gilmore. They like names. Thank goodness he was called Locke because there were lots of Jonathan Gilmores and lots of Clifford Gilmores in town. But anyway, um, we were married and then in, um, we were married in March and four months later, um, Locke received word that he had been offered the command of the ship um, R.B. Fuller that was in Liverpool. So he sailed to Liverpool and took command of the, um, of the ship. Now, at that time, some of the young women went with their husbands to sea um, and went on voyages with them. I didn't. Um, I, I stayed at home um, and stayed with my parents. Um, we knew from letters and from the information that came from the shipping news um, where the ship was. And over the next mm, almost two years, we saw, we saw it move. It went from Liverpool to San Francisco, back to Europe, um, to the Orient, back to, back to San Francisco, around and around. And two years later, um, at, or almost two years later, it was in, the ship was in, um, in what's now, um, what's Burma now. And it was heading back across um, to, um, to head back to, to England. But unfortunately, um, she, she started leaking and the ship pulled into, um, it's the Mauritius Island, which is an island off the west coast of, um, of Africa. And it pulled in and to um, the, the notice that came in the Bangor Daily News um, on March 24th said that the ship had pulled in, um, leaking, it had sold some of its um, cargo that was damaged, and a few days later, Captain Locke Gilmore died. And we are told that he was buried at sea. <sighs> so, just short of two years after we were married, um, my husband was dead. I had spent four months with him of our entire marriage. Um, the body was never recovered and we built a monument and um, put it in um, Gordon Cemetery in Searsport. It's a lovely monument saying that he had been, um, that he had been buried at sea, that he wasn't there. <sighs> so I stayed with my parents um, and unfortunately, our unfortunate luck was not over. Um, in 1879, my sister Ella was pregnant with her first child. And on the 23rd of December, she gave birth to a little boy um, named Frank Irving for his father. And um, the next day, on Christmas Eve, my sister Ella died as a result of her travail. I continued to live with my parents, and Frank and the little boy lived with his parents in Searsport. Um, and when he was not at sea, he was at home with them. Um, I continued, obviously. Um, Irving was my only nephew, and so I spent time with him. Um, and in some ways, I was a mother figure to him. And, mmm, 11 years, well, nine years later, when he was nine, um, 10 years after Locke had died, 
I married my brother-in-law, um, and we uh, we raised Irving um, really as our as our own child. Um, in fact, when um, when I died in 1911, um, I was at I was at um, Irving's house. He was a dentist in Lewiston, and I was there and was stricken um, with heart failure um, and died. Um, and four years later, um, Irving, my husband, Frank um, Irving, my husband died um, as well in Searsport. The stories, you know, from your perspective, um, the stories seem unbelievable. Um, you don't think, you don't worry that your husband is going to be lost at sea. Um, you don't usually worry that you're going to die in the birth of a child. Um, and certainly it is not common now to, um, to marry your brother-in-law, um, but times were different and the world was a different place. Um, and it's, I think it's saddening to think as I look back on all the things that have happened since my death um, and how much the world has changed um, and how much that piece of Searsport hopefully um, well, the tragedy of it is hopefully gone forever. And thank you for coming to visit and hearing my story. This wind, this wind, it was just, it's been a horrible month for wind this month. I've lost two brothers within the past month. First, my brother Evie Blanchard was on the ship that R.R. Thomas, and they came into wind and he, What 62-year-old man decides to be a captain at sea, I ask you. He had had a whole life sailing since the age of 12 with Papa. Been retired to the farm that my parents had in East Corneth, but then decided to go back to sea. 62 years old. And he had a stroke on the ship. And they tried to take him into port. They were going from Hong Kong to the East Coast. And they're trying to round the Cape of Cape Horn, and they can't put into port. The, the wind just kept them from getting to port, and oh, he, they buried him. And then a month later, my brother Hollis was the captain of the steamship Portland, and there's this horrible Thanksgiving gale, oh, and he put out with a load of passengers from Boston to Portland, and they saw him passing the graves just outside of Boston at 9 o'clock and the captain coming the other way on another ship said what was that Blanchard? Blanchard must be crazy um, and the last time someone saw him was on Thatcher's Island off of Cape Ann and it was steaming by no problem but an hour later the storm hit the storm, the wind the snowstorm, um, and somehow in the night, I guess Hollis decided he couldn't make Portland, and so he ended up going towards trying to put into Provincetown. But the ship went down, and the bodies were lining the beaches, and oh, just horrible. And the agent at the Boston office for the steamship said, Captain Blanchard, um, was considered one of the most careful men in the company's employ, and we cannot conceive that he would ever lose his boat with him up without making every effort to save the lives of the passengers. I'm sure that Captain Blanchard did his duty as a man and the captain of the steamer in charge of the lives of his passenger. But then the next day, the manager for the steamship placed the entire blame of the calamity on Captain Blanchard. Captain List, uh, Mr. Liston was about to start for Boston. He ordered the Bay State, which was another steamer, to stay in Portland until 9 o'clock at least. And he telephoned the same order to the agent down in Boston. And they heard Cap Mr. Williams give the order that my brother Hollis stay in port. But the captain, Hollis, said, I should start at 9 o'clock. And off he went. I don't know. So they've place the whole blame on them, and anyone who knows my Hollis, my brother Hollis, knows that he would never disobey orders, 
because you disobey an order when you get into port they're going to fire you so what's the true story who knows hollis lies at the bottom of the ocean and we'll never know and this wind the wind is still blowing and oh, i just don't know i was in london my my throat started going and I started getting the little red spots and I kept waiting for the doctor. They were going to send the doctor and, and they promised me I'd still be in the opera. I was going to play the lead in Martha and Anna Carey was traveling with me. She had, she had gone with me to St. Petersburg and Milan and Paris. I loved Milan. Now I'm back in Grandpa Matthew's house. Has anyone told Father? Someone should tell Father. Someone should write Father and let him know that I'm... And his mother here. I have, to, I have to get back to London. They're expecting me. I, I still need to practice more. I must go find Mother. Hello, welcome. I'm here to tell you a story from hundreds of years ago about the royal tar. It's a sad story and I'm only here a short while to tell you about it, but it's very meaningful to me. The royal tar was a steamboat. And wait, you're probably wondering, why is a clown here to be telling me about a steamboat? Well, do you think there were circuses back in the 1800s? Do you think there were clowns in the 1800s? <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that I was part of a circus that chartered the Royal Tar, a steamboat, from 1836. Yes, they chartered the steamboat to take them from New Brunswick over to Maine. Well, the Royal Tar was a very fancy steamboat. And I was going to be part of this circus, and I was so excited. I was excited about the steamboat, the Royal Tar, and I was excited about being in the circus. Well, the owners of the Royal Tar, they launched a big party out of New Brunswick to share the wonders of the steamboat and of the Royal Tar. That was in 1836 in the spring, and they had hot meals, hundreds of hot meals for 200 passengers and they took a little spin around the harbor and they drank rivers of sherry and oceans of champagne and it was just a grand day. They had a brass band and they shared what a safe vessel this was. In that day, the steamboat was quite the innovation. You know, they boiled water essentially to make steam that turned a wheel there was a wooden wheel on the Royal Tar, and it was quite the thing. I had never been on a steamboat before, and many of the people had never been on a steamboat before, so it was quite exciting. The owners shared that the rooms were as fancy as state rooms, like in a hotel. So as you can imagine, I was very excited about going on the Royal Tar. Well, that day, it was in October, when we were all boarding, it was amazing. You can just picture the circus was going to board the Royal Tar. So the circus included a menagerie, a menagerie of animals. The Burgess and Dexter Zoological Institute was chartering the Royal Tar, and there were up to 30 different animals. There was an elephant, imagine an elephant going onto the ship, a tiger, there were exotic birds, there were painted wagons. It was quite the commotion as they boarded the Royal Tar. Well, I didn't expect this, but there were also passengers. There were probably, well, actually in all, there were almost 100 passengers. So it was very crowded on the Royal Tar. Yet I was very excited. You know, there was also a wax museum and a brass band and it was just a very exciting day. 
It was very crowded, though, to picture all these animals on the stern of the ship. And all the passengers, most of the passengers, made their way to their staterooms because it was so crowded. It was so crowded, I saw them lowering two life rafts into the water to make room for all the animals. Many of the guests, and remember, you have women and, and men and children and the women in their long dresses and the men with their top hats and the children. They went to their staterooms, settled in, put their treasures in the ship safe, and I made my way to the animals. That was my favorite thing to do, and I especially loved Mogul the elephant. He became one of my favorites. I looked into his big eyes that were very confused. What was he doing on a ship? <laughs> Imagine an elephant on a ship, and there were all these other animals. Well, <clears throat> We made our way, we started out in New Brunswick, we started out for Maine, and it was violent waves, as Captain Reed would say. It was very rocky, strong winds from the west, and so we had to anchor for three days in the Eastport area. Finally, we set out again, and we headed south, and we were in Machias Bay for one day, and then that night, Captain Reed said we could go. So we set off sail again, well, steamboat, and headed south. And we were down by Final Haven, and it seemed like things were going well. And then the ship's engineer, I heard him yelling, Captain Reed, the water is at a dangerously low level. Captain Reed said, Anchor! Fire! A fire erupted and the crew was able to put out a small fire. Something must have been smoldering because within no time, fire erupted again midship right under the animals and the fire fanned by the western winds just erupted. It was a sheet of fire over the ship. Smoke everywhere. Passengers panicking, running out of their staterooms, onto the deck. The crack of fire, people screaming, panic. 19 able-bodied men got into one of the life rafts and rowed to shore. There was one life raft left. Captain Reed spent all his time going back and forth to another vessel that was on the water, saving people. Meanwhile, people feeling the heat of the fire, jumped up right into the water. Mothers had to throw their children into the water. And I, I cared so much for the animals. We loosened the chains on the animals, but they didn't want to move. I had to, I had to jump. I had to abandon them. I jumped in. Eventually, the fire became so strong, the animals were starting to panic. I jumped in, I grabbed onto a piece of driftwood, and I was holding onto it. I looked up, and what did I see? Mogul the elephant was coming over the side, and Mogul landed right near me, and I plunged down. And let's say Mogul and I met on the other side. That day, 32 people and the circus and the ship perished. The ship sank. It was on fire for hours. It sank. All the animals except for two horses perished and 42 people were saved. I still am haunted by that day. The survivors met every year to commemorate the day and I was always there in spirit. They didn't know it. I was there in spirit. And in fact, I'm on my way, October 25th, 1836 is the day the ship went down. And I'm on my way now to commemorate that day, that day that will haunt me forever. And that is my story. Thank you for listening. I'll be on my way now. You're not one of them darn rebels, are you? Uh, I tell you. Yeah, they're calling it the War of Northern Aggression these days, and who defied the first shot, that's what I'd like to know. Seems to me it was them firing on Sumter. Well, 
I've got a bone to pick with him anyway. 861, I was heading for Cuba with Loto Mumba on the brig BK Eden, the sweetest little vessel you ever saw. And uh, was below decks working on the log, and I heard a shot. Well, that brought me up on deck in a hurry, and there was a trim little schooner lying off our quarter, and it had a cannon on board, and they were calling me to heave to. Well, they had the gun, and I didn't, so I had to do what they said. It was a privateer out of Charleston, South Carolina. Blasted place. Anywho, they came aboard and told me I was a prize of war and uh, proceeded to rob me blind. And then, you know what they did then? They burned the BK Eaton after looting everything on board, that is. <sighs> And then they took me ashore, put me in a prison camp. Three different ones, in fact, conditions where I wouldn't keep a dog in. Well, they finally exchanged me for some southerners and captured, but to this day, can't abide a darn rebel.